Hi there. Uh, thank you for joining the Ultradent Digital Series. It's a pleasure to be with everyone. Today's topic, demystifying cementation. So as you can tell, we're going to talk about delivering indirect dentistry and talk about some strategies and materials and technique selection that will hopefully set up the participants for more success. At the bottom, you'll see my email address. And while this is a digital presentation, we don't have the option to bounce questions and Q&A off of each other. I always welcome participants to email me directly if they have any questions or have areas that need clarification. Love to hear from people. So let's get going into the presentation here. Um, a little bit about me so that you can kind of frame your biases based on my message, see where I come from and maybe how to uh, take everything with a grain of salt. I basically wear three hats. The biggest one is that I'm an educator. I teach at University Pacific at the dental school, have done so ever since graduation in 1991. At first I was one day a week and kind of did it out of the passion of teaching, but slowly got more integrated into the process and caught the bug. So now I'm full-time at Pacific and full-time for me means four days, which I compressed down into three days. That leaves time for the second hat that I wear. Ever since graduation in 1991, I've been in private practice, continue to stay active in private practice. And in fact, we have several practices now. So not just a textbook or a type of non jockey. I actually have uh, practices that have to remain financial going concerns. And so it's important to understand that I come from that background as well. Finally, uh, I work with industry with manufacturers, we evaluate products, do beta set testing. I'm on stage a bit with my uh, catapult group on the speakers bureau. And so that's basically what brings me to the group today is my um, kind of passion for education and working with colleagues beyond just working with students. So as I mentioned, I'm with the catapult group. If you ever have a chance to listen to any catapult speakers, they're some of the biggest, most well-known names in the country. I call this group my friends. And it's a great group of guys and gals. We have a rule that we check our egos at the door and bounce ideas off of each other. So hopefully what that means for an audience is that our message is a little bit more tempered, less of a personal bias message, that it goes through a series of filters and hopefully provides better, more edu um, evidence-based education for the audience. So I welcome you to go to the website, check out Catapult Education. We do a lot. Now, with any presentation, there's always a disclaimer. Um, I am sponsored today by Ultradent. Obviously, I'm speaking through the Ultradent digital series, but I in no way hold any stock or have any remuneration from sales from Ultradent. They simply sponsor the honorarium for the presentation. So when we talk about cementation, it's always nice to throw these old pictures up here. Uh, this is a snapshot of the materials that I was trained with when we talked about indirect dentistry back in the late 80s and early 90s when I graduated. We basically had a few simple options. We had gold crowns, which were quote unquote, the gold standard. If somebody said we wanted something a little bit more aesthetic, we would cut away some of the metal and stack porcelain, felspathic porcelain on it. It became PFM crowns. If we needed more significant core buildups where just the standard amalgam core didn't work, at times we would talk about cementing or bonding in posts. And we had the most reliable <laughs> uh, advanced desensitizing medium called copolite. Some people may have some of that in a drawer somewhere with the bottle cap sealed. We're pretty sure it's carcinogenic and it just doesn't exist in dentistry anymore. And we had a whopping two cements to choose from. Our faculty would teach us how to painstakingly go through the process of mi mixing zinc phosphate one drop at a time to get the right working time, to get something with very you know, minimal retentive power. And the beginnings of the glass ionum or looting cements were starting to hit the market. So it was a simple time. We open up the materials catalog right now, whether it's the Ultranet catalog or Shine catalog, you will see that they're like phone pages. And there's just tons and tons of material to choose from. So it's a different era. And with that comes a different sophistication means we all have to be on point, know our materials, know what to use, how to use it, and really be keen on our techniques. And so you're going to look at these kinds of boards now, rather than just the limited 
armamentarium we had before. This is the type of stuff that dominates the market. Like I said, have to stay abreast of the materials and the folks that are attending the lecture obviously have um, a passion to do so. So we'll start and I'll speak a lot with this overriding backdrop or framework. This is the average overhead for a US office. It runs at $390 an hour, which equals $6.50 a minute. That's a very important number to me because what it does speak to is efficiency and predictability, especially in my practice when I'm only in the practice a day and a half a week, I can't afford to have redos, reruns, repairs, uh, repeat procedures. Those are tremendous fiscal drains. So whether it's from doing direct dentistry, placing a composite and patient having sensitivity, whether it's with an impression that has to be remade, whether it's a temporary that fractures and has to be remade, whether it's crowns that are cemented or bonded to come off or break, or the patient complains of sensitivity, all these things lead to me, the doctor, having to revisit the patient. It's a not a charged procedure. We have to do it to fix the problem. And so there's a huge fiscal drain related to that when it's $6.50 a minute and you constantly have emergencies or readdressing procedures placed on the schedule. And those costs were pre-pandemic. We know that our lives got turned upside down about a year ago with COVID. So now going forward, we know the patients are tending to postpone some of the high dollar elective procedures. There's more in-office overhead costs when we talk about the increase in PPE costs and all the other related things. We're seeing one patient at a time, we have reduced volume, we now have people stacked up in the waiting rooms, we have broader gaps, we're leaving time for aerosol to settle and we have filtration going on in the office. Things are starting to get back to what we called kind of pre-pandemic normal, but we know that this has just put a whole new spotlight on the way we practice. And we're probably being a little bit more cautious and working a little bit more um, kind of smart in that sense, which generally means we have less time for repeat procedures and wasted chair time. So the speed, efficiency, predictability, outcomes, reduction or reduce, all these things are more imperative than ever before. So if I flash this picture up, for the audience, what are the thoughts that come to mind? You know, what, what, do we, what do we see in this mouth? And this is often a great picture when I have a live course and I can bounce back and forth with the audience, but I'll tell you, typically hands go up and people say, okay, well, I see a little decay maybe. They're usually referring to this tooth here. People certainly bring up wear. They say that this person has maybe attrition, maybe erosion, they're missing teeth. They have some restorative needs. They may speak a little bit to a periodontal issue, although there's not much evidence of that. And of course, they talk about these two restorations, these two PFMs or the shells of the PFMs that are there. What if I told you that these PFMs were placed less than six months prior to this picture? Was a porcelain fused and metal crown the right choice for this patient? So this is just an excerpt from a chart that Dr. Christensen published, uh, I think in one of the um, dental tabloids, it might've been dentistry today or so, uh, with data from one of the biggest labs in dentistry, Glidewell Lab. And it was just a statement on, it was an article statement on the trends in Crown and Bridge and where we're headed. And this is the data they got because Glidewell has such big volume, they basically are reflective of what's going on in the United States. They said, okay, in 2007, Here's the percentage of crown and bridge that doctor ordered, which was PFMs, 65%, a big chunk. People were doing all ceramic restorations in 2007, nearly a quarter were that. Of course, there was the quote unquote gold standard doing gold or full veneer crowns, and then the small percentage of the uppers. The study was published in 2013. Look at the dramatic change in six years. PFMs plummeted down to the teens. All ceramics are now four out of every five restorations and all metal restorations are shrinking to nothing. Now, propagate that forward. We're now in 2021. Fast forward eight more years. I would venture to the guess that PFMs are now in the low single digits. All ceramics even further dominate somewhere in the mid 90 percentile. We probably are doing less gold work 
and the others are always the others. Those are those kind of one-off types of materials that are not frequently getting traction. So what does this tell us? Does it tell us metal is bad? Uh, not necessarily. There are some advantages using ceramics. Uh, there are times where metal is necessary, but I think we can practice really effective indirect dentistry primarily using ceramics. So the trends in Crown and Bridge today, the ceramics dominate the market. The leading labs report that there's a huge prevalence of ceramic orders compared to the traditional metal-based materials. The zirconia-based crowns lead the way. And so the Gen 1 zirconias that were a little bit uh, more opaque and kind of the early market leaders have graduated to the four and five Y generation. They're becoming more and more aesthetic. Emax or lithium disilicate is still the leading silica-based ceramic prescribed. And there is an ongoing emphasis for increased conservation. Restorative styles that are more kind with regards to tooth preservation, more inlays, more onlays, more overlays, flap top crowns, minimum prep or prepless types of restorations. Uh, these are all good trends. It's the right way we should be moving in dentistry. If we have healthy tooth structure, can we add to it? Can we reinforce it? Can we make it more aesthetic and yet retain as much of what mother nature gave us as possible without compromising the final result? And even with that in mind, still the majority of the bread and butter crown and bridge is traditional single unit crowns. Patients still have teeth with large restorations with breakdown with fractures where the margins are gonna approximate the gum line. And certainly there's a whole slew of teeth that have already been crowned and eventually the old crowns fail it's time for a replacement crown. So this is still single unit restorations, traditional or what we call traditional crowns are still you know, the dominant market leaders, what's ordered from the labs. And then we can look at the ceramic options that kind of dominate the market right now, the ones that are standing the test of time. Uh, the one that I would say is essentially on the way to becoming extinct, but it's still a force out there, there's lots of patients walking around with Empress crowns in their mouth, is the loose side glass ceramics, Empress. That was the early 21st century aesthetic workhorse. In the late 90s, early 2000s, we were starting to migrate away from spathic porcelain to some degree, and Empress became our main aesthetic driver. This is from the era of kind of ear to ear preps and smile makeovers. Empress did its job, did its job very well, but it had some limitations. Other things that have stood the test of time but are also starting to go be on the way out are the zirconia coping supported ceramics. The common brand names there are Lava, Procera, but there's lots of variations of this where there's a zirconia core with traditional layered porcelain, feldspathic porcelain over the top. And then IPS, Avicar uh, released IPS Emax and it basically replaced Empress it had a lot of the similar benefits to Empress as far as aesthetics and presentation while mitigating some of the disadvantages. And we'll go into that. And then of course the monolithic zirconia crowns where the gen one was the most common term used was the Bruxer crown. That's a, a brand name out of Glidewell. But long story short, these were the very strong initial release in the market of zirconia to full contour monolithic. And over time, we've got enhanced versions of this and we'll get into that later on in the presentation as well. And of course, there's a slew of combination technologies where there's variations of all of the above combined together or modified in a way that leads to better options and outcomes for doctors. So if we start with Empress, pros and cons, it's great material, but the cons of the material led to spur new innovation. Empress had a seven year survival record of about 90%. Really good aesthetic potential, great opportunity because you basically have pressable hot glass. You could get really good margins, not dissimilar to the typical lost wax technique. It was very kind to opposing tooth structure, which is a little bit different than how we considered feldspathic porcelain. We would see PFM crowns sometimes mow down the opposing tooth structure. But the cons, it was very fragile, particularly pre bonding. And even once it was bonded at best, it was an intermediate strength ceramic. Had very critical handling nuances. First of all, like a lot of the silica-based 
materials, you had to have hydrofluoric acid conditioning, then you had to have silination. So there's lots of steps to get the restorations ready to be bonded. And then the actual bonding protocol was very exacting. We had to pay attention, close attention to isolation, all the things that are involved in enamel and dentin bonding. And the thickness, how much we reduced the tooth, how thick the actual restoration was, had a critical window. Too thin was dangerous, too thick was not great. And so it had some limitations as far as how conservative we could be and how much tooth structure we could preserve. Or if there was too much tooth structure gone, how much unsupported ceramic we could safely lay. And the translucency that helps make Empress so potentially aesthetic also led to some limitations with darker stumps. Even though we could use less translucent or more opaque ink kits, it still had a limiting factor to it. But these are just some videos we have from some of the older um, weekend warrior aesthetic courses that we have put on hands-on with live patients of doing smile redesigns and bonding in veneers and full crowns. And those were the good old days, early 2000s. And we would put a lot of these on ourselves. These are just three video clips of maybe 15 or 20. You can see that there's a pretty good circus going on here. Um, there's a split dam, rubber dam clamps on either side. Uh, the slot dam is isolating all the teeth in question. I think we were bonding in eight veneers here. You can see there's Teflon tape protecting the adjacent teeth. We have bite registration paste sealing the palate to not allow moisture or condensation to go through. Uh, long story short, this was a lot of work to do a good job with the bonding. Often that bonding or delivery day was probably more difficult than the prep day for me. So, it was necessary, it still is necessary sometimes, but it led to development of materials, cements, techniques that sometimes alleviated some of these pain points. So now let's graduate to the next set of ceramics. And we're gonna eventually get to talk about cementation, but so much of the cementation depends on the actual substrate you're cementing. So when we talked about the zirconia core ceramics, the lavas, the proceras of the world, these again have a very proven track record. They've been around now for 20 plus years. Uh, the real benefit of these was, first of all, the accuracy through that digital pathway led to pretty good aesthetics, uh, pretty good uh, margins, pretty good fit accuracy. But the fact that there's supporting coping allowed us to put a more reinforced restoration onto the tooth that didn't require adhesion to reinforce the restoration. Empress crowns were already vulnerable we needed to bond them to the tooth, essentially make them the artificial enamel to the dentin substructure through exacting bonding procedures to regain that strength. The zirconia core became the critical foundation for strength for these layered ceramics. And so it allowed us to go a step backwards and use more simplified kind of squirt and go cementation techniques. It also allows us to create bridges because we weren't able to do bridge work. We could only do single unit restorations with Empress. Now we can have short and long span bridges. They still allowed us translucency, which was different than metal cores like PFMs where we had to opacify it. But the main thing here was we were able to go to our favorite cements, whether we're using a self-adhesive resin cement, we'll talk about these, or an RMGI or a bioceramic, or if we had very non-retentive preps, we could go through a series of zirconia bonding protocols and pull these off and get simple cementation protocols in place or go through the extra trouble to actually bond these, which is very rare. We typically were able to cement them. But just some photos, you know, through the digital pathway, you can see that we can get very good margins. These are all sub 50 microns and these are just slides shared from 3M from, from uh, Lava, Crown and Bridges. You can see compared to a PFM, even though zirconia can look opacious to us, it still allows some light to go through. So we're able to hide some darker substrates, but at the same time, give a more natural kind of a translucence to a tooth and make more aesthetic restorations. And a lot of this eliminate the errors with handling models. Technicians would have to trim traditional gypsum based models, not nick dyes or not nick margins. When a lot of this is done virtually, and especially if you're doing scanning into the equation where you don't have the potential for impression inaccuracies, 
we could have very accurate outcomes and be very specific about where our core is, where we want to build up the zirconia, where we want to stack the porcelain on top of it so that we fall within the parameters. Here's an example of a zirconia bridge. And one of the big things here is they don't have the flexibility like metal that has a little bit of flex or bend to it. So metal based crown and bridge, often you would see if it's under a high, high load area, we're used to seeing PFM crowns and or bridges that would potentially flex a little bit leading to the feldspathic porcelain chipping away. And then we'd have to go do porcelain repairs or polish it or just tell the patient, hey, it's in the back, nobody sees it, just deal with it. Zirconia is very rigid. So you're not gonna have that delamination risk. However, when you do have a fracture, it's not something that you can patch or repair. It's either good, 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 or you have catastrophic fracture, which means that we have to pay very close attention to connector width and depth. If it's in a high load area on a patient that's got, you know, heavy loads as a bruxer, we have to make sure that these connectors are at critical minimum thresholds. Otherwise, a bridge is at risk for fracture. And when we look at single unit cores, we can stain and dip these, get those stumps to match natural tooth structure on either side before we lay the overlaying ceramics so we can get very good aesthetic outcomes or results. All of this with the ease of just being able to cement it conventionally with some of the easier handling cements. So when we look at these um, kind of limitations of zirconia, there's not a lot, but again, reduction is an issue. We have to take a little bit more away to allow the technician room for the zirconia core and the porcelain that's being layered on top of it. And since we are traditionally looting or going through simple cementation, not bonding more typically, we can't say goodbye to our retention or resistance principles. We can't ignore these. In the cases where we don't have very retentive preps, short over tapered situations, we do have the ability to go over zirconia bonding. We'll talk a lot about that because we use a lot of zirconia these days, but it takes more steps. Otherwise, these were fairly universal restorative materials and they served us well. They're again, slowly being used less and less, but variations or hybrids of these are being used because zirconia has come a long ways and the way we layer or micro layer it has changed quite a bit. And these restorations were the drivers for the current explosion and in innovations in zirconia based crown and bridge. Next thing we'll jump to is Emacs. Ivoclar released this God, I'm gonna say a dozen years ago or so, maybe more. And this was a game changer. Suddenly a lot of the limitations with the traditional ceramics were gone. Uh, monolithic lithium disilicate was very, very strong. We can make it more aesthetic by cutting it back and adding feldspathic to it. But those areas where we added and layered were a little bit weaker. It came both in pressable ingots, which could lead to really good margins or CAD based milled blocks, whether this is done in the lab or somebody you know, in the CERAC world, for example, does it with chair side mills. These are available high and low translucencies, but now with this strength, we have more indications in the posterior where e Empress was uh, vulnerable to fracture. So we get higher strength, the same potential for aesthetics, about two and a half times stronger than Empress, still same translucency, light, light diffusion, it's designed to replicate what natural tooth structure looks like. And the great thing was that while we got stronger and stronger with the ceramics, we still had ceramics that were kind to posing tooth structure. Now that's assuming that they're finished and polished the right way, and that's important. Early on, of course, Ivoclar wanted to show the best success. The first kind of breakthrough, groundbreaking four-year clinical trial was with Emacs delivered through a full adhesive protocol and after four years, they showed 99% success rate. That's unheard of in the PFM world. We just don't get that. PFMs, usually the eight year study that I can think of was about 89% success. So that was early on. They wanted to show the best outcomes possible and Ivoclar recommended bonding every Emacs crown. Uh, in the market, people start to experiment and go off label. And so some people are simply cementing Emacs crowns with more traditional self-adhesive resins or RMGIs, while some people were tried and true full bonded protocols. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But here's just some examples of uh, 
Emacs restorations, micro layered on the facial cutback and micro layered from just cases in the office. This was a full mouth rehab. The posterior crowns were going to be done. Some of them are implants, some of them are crowns. Uh, as we went further back in the posterior, we graduated to uh, 4Y zirconia, monolithic zirconia, but in the anteriors, kind of in the uh, front window. Use a couple of different lighted views, and you can see with good technicians and good design, we can get very, very aesthetic restorations, but you can see the micro layer changes the presentation of the uh, restorations on the outside, but you can see it's monolithic, uh, monolithic lithium disilicate on the lingual to full contour, which we're still yet to polish here. Um, and we use these all the times for traditional veneers, ultra thin veneers, um, prepless veneers. This is a very durable material that said, the thinner and thinner we make it, the more important it is to consider bonding the material. I infrequently cement Emacs. While there's fans of cementing Emacs, and I'm never saying never, I do occasionally cement Emacs, but 90% of the time I'm bonding it because of the indications I'm using it for. But again, not a lot of limitations. However, in load bearing areas, here's a recurring theme. We always need about one and a half to two millimeters of reduction. That's similar to the other ceramics we talked about. And with Emacs, we were able to go up to three units, three short anterior span units of a bridge, but anything longer than that, we really needed the zirconia coping. And so whenever bridge work is involved, we're talking about using zirconia. This strength, especially when it's bonded, also equates to incredibly difficult removal. So if anybody's had to cut off bonded Emacs restorations, they know that they've got a fight on their hands and they have to have the right burrs and the right amount of time and patience to do it safely. But that's about it. This was a very universal ceramic, but lo and behold, time goes by. And now lithium disilicate's been on the market for quite a while. And there's been a lot of off-label and on-label uh, investigation with it. As I said, we use this sometimes for reduced prep restorations. And so we started to deliver Emacs veneers that were maybe half a millimeter thick only. We started to put one to 1 1.5. So we dropped this range down by half a millimeter on the occlusals of posterior teeth. And we started to see really good outcomes. And some of these studies now have eight to 10 year outcomes showing still in the mid 90s, 94 to 96% survival and success rates, which is great. So the word of caution there is that as soon as you start to cheat on that reduction. And many times it's for good reason. You may have a tooth that's already very worn. You're trying to preserve the tooth. The thinner your substrate is, the more you have to commit to bonding. If you have thicker occlusal reduction, your ceramics is able to give you a thicker monolithic ingot press of Emacs, and the patient doesn't have harsh occlusion, meaning they have good anterior guidance, canine exclusion, and your premolar to barely first molar range isn't under very, very hard load, you could consider traditional cementation. Traditional cementation goes e easier, faster, quicker, not as many steps, but at what cost? So when we see that success range between 94 to 96%, the range there usually speaks to cases that were cemented traditionally versus bonded. So it really depends on where you draw your line in the sand and how cautious you are with your reduction. Now we'll graduate over to monolithic or all zirconia restorations. And now suddenly Gen 1 strength jumps up to or over a thousand. They're incredibly robust, incredibly uh, strong and one millimeter thick. And these were the perfect solutions for those second molars or short worn teeth. In fact, they were called Bruxer crowns. So they're for Bruxer patients. Of course, it's monolithic zirconia. Bridges are possible just like layered zirconia probably more successful because now we don't have to cut back those bridge connectors or those solder joints and make them thinner. But again, counterintuitively, as long as these were polished appropriately, while they're incredibly strong, we have very favorable wear rates to opposing enamel. That being said, when we deliver these restorations and check for occlusion, as we make adjustments chair side from the supposed excellent finish that the lab delivered for us, we have to have the right armamentarium to be able to go back and recreate that high finish. A fake 
overlay glaze in the oven won't do it because the resulting output is still a very porous, high friction, kind of essentially sandpaper result that will beat up opposing occlusion. We have to get these super, super smooth so that there's zero friction between it and the tooth opposing it. First generation zirconias left a little bit something to be desired with aesthetics. You can see here's a couple of uh, restorations that were replaced and they looked kind of dead. They looked um, very opacified. Now in the back where they didn't show, most patients prefer this to a gold or silver colored crown, but yeah, we want our cake and to eat it too. So some of the strategies to overcome these limitations in aesthetics have been to layer ceramics, which is nothing new. That's what lava crowns were. We basically cut back zirconia all the way. Now we're experimenting with how much layer. And of course, there's been the development of more um, high translucency zirconias. So this is just a slide from one of the labs that I work with, Microdental. And they have a couple of products. For example, they have their version of the uh, Zeus, which is a high translucency zirconia, maybe the 4Y for the posteriors, 3Y for the anteriors, and or they can get a monolithic, more durable 3 to 5, 3 to 4Y monolithic mill and only cut back the party side. This is not different than a three quarter metal occlusal PFM. The buckle cusps and down the facial aspect around the horizon, they can cut back a micro layer, but leave the areas that are the functional cusps on lingual, full durable monolithic zirconia. So it stands the test of occlusion. So there's lots of strategies with this. And of course, Ivoclar got involved as well. But here's an example of an a program where uh, 5Y anterior monolithic mill of zirconia, where the program has all of it clear to the incisal edge that's gonna handle protrusive guidance or lateral guidance in monolithic. And there's just a micro layer cutback coming out of the mill. So the technician can minimally layer feldspathic porcelain over the top and enhance it to make this look really, really natural. So already the sub foundation, the zirconia is very translucent. And on top of that, we're able to layer that and make it more aesthetic. So now we have less and less limitations. It used to be that if you wanted something very aesthetic, you'd go with lithium disilicate. If you wanted something very durable, you'd go with zirconia. Now the lines between the two are getting more and more blurred. The nice thing is when you're cementing these, you can go with traditional cementation techniques if you have natural retention. We don't have to go through and bond. Like I said, Ivoclar wasn't gonna be left behind. You know, they had some of the great ceramic introductions into the market. And of course, um, they wanna leverage brand names for recognition. And so Emacs is such a big player that they developed Emacs Prime, which is, has nothing to do with monolithic zirconia. They're just using that marketing term. It is their version of a gradient zirconia, which allows combination of 5Y and 3Y based on the presentation of a tooth. This puck has a more aesthetic or more translucent enamel position, a gradient layer in between, and a dentin layer where it's a little bit more durable zirconia. And so when we mill restorations out of this, there's no more reason to layer anymore. The, the notion is that we can get very nice aesthetics out of something that can come milled right out of the lab and be cemented traditionally rather than bonded. So long story short, and this is just a cross section of a few of these. We have an all days or a ceramic um, offerings presentation, and we're really gonna talk about cementation today. But the point is cementation strategy depends on what you're actually cementing. So it's important to review what the more typical substrates are and how we wanna approach that. So let's talk about where we all live. This is roughly the market divided into thirds. If we were to ask doctors out there, how do you cement your crowns? So let's talk about traditional you know, full veneer crowns or, or uh, full contour crowns. Roughly into thirds, although they're not even thirds. A little bit more than the thirds say, you know what? I just have my traditional preferential RMGI cements. This is a, Resin modified glass ionomer. Here's some of the names that we can talk about. Ultrasem is an offering from Ultradent. Fujisem is a, you know, a market leader from GC. Ceramir is a bar of ceramic cement. Here's a product from Voco, for example. 
Another roughly third will say, you know what? I use a self-adhesive resin cement. This is pure resin, but I don't want to go through the process of isolation and applications of conditioners and bonding agents and what have you. I've heard that this kind of sticks to the tooth. It gives me some bond and it's very simple, easy for me to clean up. An example of those are Reliax Unisem, uh, Bifix SC stands for self-etching. That's from Voco, Maxem from Kerr. And there's many, many more. I'm just showing you samples of these. And then of course, there's the highest common denominator, the bonded resin cements. Again, from Voco, Permaflow, Dual Cure, Permashade, NX3 from Kerr, Bifix QM from Voco, you guys will have heard of, Reliax Ultimate, you will have heard of Multilink, and basically every manufacturer out there has cements in all of these categories. So how do we decide what to use, when to use? When do we bond? When do we cement? So some of the considerations for bonding versus cementation are, does my restoration need reinforcement? As we kind of talk through the classes of restorations that are prevalent right now, we talked about things that are lower strength ceramics like Empress, where we have no choice, we must bond. Our bonding procedure becomes the reinforcement or becomes the dentin for that fake overlay of enamel. But there's times we're using modified higher strength ceramics like Emacs, where we're using them at a crit critical thinness or thickness where we still need to reinforce. There's times where we have to have a better marginal seal. If we have in-office mills, our in-office mills with shoulder-based preparations do not mill sealed margins at the 25 to 50 micron range. They're often at the 100 plus microns. In those cases, those margins don't approximate R2 structure very well. Microscopic, they're more open. And that's by design. That's the way the system works. So if we put a more soluble, weaker cement in that area, it has the potential to wash out. In those cases, we wanna use a bonded resin cement so that that margin now is permanently sealed and it becomes the continuation of our crown margin. It is a durable class one composite that will then become a permanent portion of that restoration, just like direct composites are considered a permanent restoration. There's times when we must bond even if we have a high strength ceramic because we don't have proper retention for it. And that's not because negligence, it's because if we're doing a very shallow inlay, overlay, onlay, if we're doing veneer preps, aesthetic veneer preps, these don't have long opposing walls. There's not natural retention. If we're inheriting a crown on a second or uh, first or second molar and the patient's on the third or fourth crown, by the time you take it off, you realize every time before it got shorter and more tapered and shorter and more tapered, there's not natural retention form. Our ceramic may not, we may be using zirconia, may not need to be reinforced, but it's not gonna stay on unless it's bonded. So there's plenty of times we have to bond. And if it's a zirconia restoration, we have to get very adept at zirconia contamination or understand what contamination means and how do we decontaminate it. Some people consider restoration removal and the impact that has there. That's less critical to me, although it's a tough day for all of us when we have to cut off high strength ceramics like lithium disilica, like zirconia, that are well bonded to the tooth. Bond strengths in the 30, 40, 50 megapascals, which are achievable. When these incredibly durable materials are now essentially fused or married to the tooth, they become very difficult to remove. And so sometimes there's some thought about, okay, what about when I have to take this off? If, if the occlusal forces and the hostility in the mouth is not gonna overcome the cement, maybe there's something to be said about using a more moderate level of adhesion with the cement for the event of retrieval or removal. And of course, there's anesthesia and patient considerations. We love to be able to deliver simplified dentistry when we don't have to do a lot of bonding, anesthesia free. Because first of all, patient's not numb for a couple of hours, more importantly there, uh, more viable feedback for checking occlusion and tapping on your articulating paper. They can give you feedback better. There's, there's less chance of having to do post-op adjustments because they really couldn't feel what was going on on the day that they were numb. So these are all the different kind of things that we consider when we decide between bonding and cementing. But let's take you through a bonded case. This is a case from many years ago. I'm gonna say this is 15 plus years ago um, where 
it was, I believe, either an MO composite or amalgam that had failed. The mesiobuccal cusp was gone, and we just determined that, hey, this is a more to structure than we feel comfortable replacing with a direct restoration. And so we said, let's do a nice uh, MOBL um, Emacs onlay. Now, prep designs might be a little different. Uh, there's been shifts in how many vertical and horizontal walls we have. There is a whole new attention made to this from the biomimetic world, but the actual adhesion and the delivery steps are not that dissimilar. We'll stay, go through this. Here's the case on the model. We can get it back from the lab and inspect it. This is monolithic lithium disilicate. There's no layering to it. It's very durable. Even in its thinnest spot, it's two millimeters thick. Some areas are four or five millimeters above the marginal ridge. So this is bonded well, this is not gonna fracture. In fact, that case is still there and it looks pretty close to what it looked like day one in the mouth. And now it's going on 15 years. This is just a little Teflon tape underneath there. I just took this photo. This was not difficult getting this restoration out because I can always grab the buckle and flick it out with a spoon or an explorer. But if you have any tight fitting inlays that don't have axial access, um, a great way to try something in is with a little Teflon tape because it becomes a bungee that you can flip out so that it doesn't lock in into the contact. Of course, we bond everything under isolation. So you can see there's an optic gate on the outside, keeping the lips and the cheeks out of the way. It helps me with photography. And there's an ice light in place. Alternatively, we can put a clamp back here. Sometimes that's not as easy and put a rubber dam. So however you're doing it, uh, I'm here to say it's important to have proper isolation every time you bond. Temporary is moved off. We're going to pumice and clean away uh, the leftover provisional cement and have a nice clean working feel. These Chiotent wave wedges are awesome because they're hollow. They sit low on the papilla. We can get the PDL to barely relax. It also becomes a gingival barrier for better isolation. It's a great way to try on onlays and inlays, especially when the margins are at least at the crest or above the gum line. If they're subgingival, can't quite fit a wedge in there. And here's the restoration back from the lab. We all know that this is chalky in appearance because it's been etched by the lab with uh, hydrofluoric acid. That said, we should put on our loops and look at it because while the majority of it is etched, look how there's a few shiny spots and they're in the critical areas, right at the margins. This is the one area I don't want any ingress. If I have anything bonded, the best part of my bonding is where my peripheral seal is. So I'll look at this and whether it's not etched as well or some of the overglaze dripped on top of there, I'm gonna recondition this. I'm going to get my uh, hydrofluoric acid, this is ultradent porcelain etch, place it on here. Now this is 9%, so on lithium disilicate, I'm not gonna leave that on more than 15 seconds. If I had the 5%, maybe I can go up to 30 seconds. The second etching should never be as long as what we're used to with silica based, where we would leave porcelain etch on for a minute plus, one to two minutes, because you can precipitate ceramic salts that reduce your bond strength. If you feel like you've left your hydrofluoric etch on there too long, put a layer of phosphoric, you know, typically blue colored etch onto the tooth and rinse that away or onto the restoration and rinse it away. That will reduce some of those salts and increase your bond strength. Then after that, now we have the entire area ripe for bonding. Now you can see there's no more shiny spots. And we'll put our silane coupling agent onto there, let it dry. Theoretically, we're ready to go. Um, these little restorations are sometimes hard to handle when you grab them with gloves. They become um, difficult. Our fingers will wipe away the cement. Do you load the cement on the inside of the inlay or onlay? Do you put the cement on the tooth and squeeze this on? How easy is this to handle, especially with rubber dams and lice lights and things like that in the way? Um, this little grip tab handle from Triadent was a great tool, although they have discontinued it. You would simply put that on there with spe specialty kind of pin tweezers. You could pick this up and lift it off. Ivaclar has a very neat kind of little glue sticks or picky sticks that you can snap onto the restoration. What I like to do is cut away the handle of it. They look like a micro brush handle. So there's just a short half an inch sticking up and I can grab that with cotton pliers. It's less weighting and I can move it in and out of the patient. So theoretically, there's our restoration tried in. We always try it in. And the question is, did I do a good job color matching? Doesn't look like I did. So let's see what happens. We're going to isolate the adjacent tooth. Um, I don't want to activate when I condition this, I don't want to accidentally activate and spray adhesive onto this tooth because then when the cement oozes out, 
I'm going to have a very tough lock. This is bonded resin cement. It's going to be very hard to saw through that and open it up. And it's not very easy to predictably floss these restorations or wipe away all the cement without you lifting up and down or minimally dislodging and bouncing the restoration up and down, creating gaps in the cement margin. So I like to at least get an initial cure before I go through there. This is a great way to make sure we don't bond to the adjacent tube. Now this is a mixed substrate. I have enamel around the periphery and dentin in the middle. So if I'm using a self-adhesive bonding agent, uh, a sixth generation or a universal generation, we know that adhesion values to the dentin are superior, but we know the gold standard for enamel conditioning is still phosphoric acid. So I'll take a selective etch approach. I will put phosphoric acid around my peripheral enamel margin and wash that away after 15 to 20 seconds. Then I'll apply, if I'm not doing total etch, which is in this case I'm not, then I'll apply my uh, dentin primer, essentially condition my dentin. Then the cement is loaded and the seeded, and you can see that the color match is actually much nicer now. Part of the reason it looked so strange was because it wasn't married with translucent cement yet. We had that chalky, opacious layer because of the hydrofluoric etching that happened. Light wasn't being transmitted, it was being interrupted. So as long as you've trusted your shade matching, we know that once we wet this with the translucent cement or whatever shade you use, that it will marry and look much more natural. In fact, these areas are the natural cusps that are a little bit desiccated from the ice light running for so long. As soon as the moisture came back, those were even less visible. It basically was hard to tell where the restoration started and ended. It's a very durable restoration, but you saw, this is not a crown that we grab, load cement in it, seat it in the mouth, have the patient bottle in a cotton roll. This is a lot of effort. We wanna make sure we plan the right amount of time. We have the right armamentarium and we're getting reimbursed the right way for this. This is a lot of work, which is why it's very desirable to have at least part of our restorations, you know, have simplified cementation. And remember our single unit crowns are still the most popular indirect restorations. They're the most prevalent. And by far, most typically these are traditional zirconia restorations. And so that leads me to the segment on zirconia. And I can talk a little bit about this opportunity I had to have this great sabbatical that I spent some time over at Ultradet. It was always a passion of mine to get to the bottom or the nitty gritty of some of these hotbed topics revolving around zirconia bonding and what you can and can't do. And can you bond the zirconia? What happens when there's saliva contamination? There's lots of research, lots of evidence on there already in, in, the, uh, in the market, but a lot of it is driven by manufacturers and so I wanted to be manufacturer agnostic. So when I got materials, I recruited materials from multiple manufacturers. Ultradent was the host and they were nice enough to let me bring outside materials in so we could have a variety from different manufacturers. Um, can we bond to zirconia was one of the first questions. And we know that people say yes and some people say no. So we have the answers for you. How do we decontaminate zirconia if it's contaminated? What's that all about? There's lots of opinions out there, lots of anecdote. And there's a lot of marketing that exists. So it's nice to be able to put aside the marketing and the anecdote and actually look at the evidence. And most of the research and studies, legitimate research studies on these are single factor studies. We were able to, it was a big task, but we were able to make a multi-factor study that hopefully will lead to a publication that will be able to provide a lot of insight for wet fingered dentists out there on how to approach zirconia and when to cement and when to bond and how to decide what to do and how often, you know, what approach to take. So here are some of the things that we tested. First of all, we used four cement classes and we used cements from different manufacturers. So I didn't stay only within the Ultradent line or only within the Cable Kerr line. We tested self-adhesive resin cement categories, RMGIs, resin modified glass isomers, the full or total bonded resin cements, and a bioceramic cement. All of them were bonded to dentin substrate because that's typically what happens in the mouth. You know, when you've prepped into a tooth, typically the majority of what you're sticking to is dentin. In some cases, uh, with very you know minimum prep like veneers or micro prep veneers, we know that mostly there's enamel. And there's not a lot of mysteries to bonding to enamel. We've been there, done that. We're, we're very good at that. We know how to do that. 
and we established some baselines or some controls. We tested untreated zirconia. We then tested treated zirconia. That's typically how you're gonna get your zirconia back from the lab is they've gone through a process of air abrasion. Not only does it have micro texture to it as it comes out from the mill, but it's still somewhat glossy, but then with aluminum oxide, they air abrade it at certain PSI. And so that will make the surface more irregular and more appropriate for bonding. And then of course, we retested all of this after there was saliva contamination. The variables we tested was the different decontamination protocols. So we evaluated what happened to our bonding values when we contaminated the zirconia on the second cycles, bonded them. And then we tested all of the samples again with some decontamination protocols. And those were to repeat the air abrasion. So theoretically, you place the crown in the patient's mouth. The phospholipids from the saliva have now preferentially stuck to that zirconia. And the data says now that zirconia is much more slick. It's got a fake Teflon coating. It's very difficult to bond to. First, we want to validate if that's the case. Secondly, let's look at the most common um, recommended decontamination protocols and be able to benchmark them against each other. Which decontamination protocol led to the best outcome? Which one got you back to par? Which one was so-so? Which one didn't work at all? One of the things we tested was IvaClean. Many of you out there have heard of IvaClean. It's an IvaClar product saying that this product will help decontaminate zirconia. And for that matter, they also recommend using it on lithium disilicate after it's been tried in. We even tried a pretreatment strategy where our zirconia or metallic primers are placed onto a non-contaminated restoration before it's tried in to see if that creates a force field and eliminates that phospholipid contamination. We even attempted a tribochemical treatment. We had standardized incubation for all of these. They basically were put in a water bath for two weeks at body temperature and standardized instron shear bond strength testing machinery was involved. And of course, statistical analysis at the end, conclusions and recommendations. This is probably gonna be a 12 to 15 page write up and it's gonna be submitted to one of the high impact journals. And so this is gonna be a year, year and a half in process. Uh, a lot to get into as far as data for this presentation, but for the sake of a 20,000 foot level presentation, I can share some of the outcomes with you so that you guys are armed for Monday morning practice, knowing what to do. So again, I went out to Ultradent and the plans kind of got rocked. My sabbatical was starting right around the time COVID was starting. So we canceled some trips and eventually it became safe to go on airplanes and limited numbers and wear masks. So at one point I made it out to Ultradent Labs. Uh, I have to thank the group there and specifically Neil Jessup and his team so much. They basically said, have at it, carte blanche. We're not gonna influence you one way or the other. We know you're testing a lot of products. Let's share our materials, our instrumentation with you, show you how to use it, and then you're on your own. So. Um, it, it, true research and investigation is very near and dear to them. It's why I like the company and why I like a lot of the materials. They have the right attitude when it comes to material development and um, just the right corporate ethics, let's say. So these are just snapshots of pictures of things. These are specific zirconia pucks that were created essentially for, for a project like this. And this took a lot of design and planning. Uh, here's a block with dentin that's cut in there. And this is the jig that shows the zirconia puck that I've cemented to that dentin that's gonna go in the incubator before we break it out. Here's, for example, a series of 14, each of them treated a certain way. Some of you will recognize this purple, that's the IvaClean. So these were contaminated zirconia pucks that then were decontaminated with four different protocols. At the end of this, I probably broke out somewhere in the neighborhood of seven or 800 pucks. It was a lot of work and this was months and months in the lab. But here's up close one of these pucks. Now they've milled one out of metal because it's easier to see these foots or these standoffs. It's a little bit harder to see because of the resolution on the zirconium. This has to be very precise and they work with a partner lab to be able to pull these off and create enough of them. This was not an inexpensive project. It was very generous of them to let me use an unlimited number of pucks. But what this meant was that this puck can sit on a substrate and with those legs, every single one we test has a uniform or 
matching cement layer thickness, which is very, very critical. Otherwise our data is way off. If one die spacer or cement layer is double or triple the next one, you're not gonna have results that can stand on their own. Uh, you're gonna have too much variability and too much deviation. Your results aren't gonna be valid. So just designing this puck so that we have equivalent cement space was a big part of this. And so I'll show you some videos. This is just, uh, audio free of just one of the days I have in the lab. On this one, I'll fast forward because these are longer, but this is me applying the peak universal self-adhesive primer. And while I'm fast forwarding this, you can see I have, I, once I got fast, I was able to do four of these at once and then air drying them, then applying the peak universal bonding agent. So obviously in this case, we're doing a total bonded protocol and I'll let this run slowly for a second, but you can see the time scrubbing. I can't tell you how important it is to adhere to manufacturer recommendations and scrub long enough. Eventually air drying, curing the adhesive layer, loading cement, this is a bonded resin cement onto these pucks, picking them up, placing them on here, squeezing the extra cement off. Simultaneously at the bottom, you can see this is after a couple of weeks of incubation. One of these is being loaded into the Instron machine to break that off and see what kind of value we got. So this was done hundreds and hundreds of times through a whole bunch of variable circumstances. And I'll fast forward some more so I didn't bore, bore you with the details, but there it is, there's our jig. This is how we secured it. And that went into a water bath. Now, you can see this one's loaded into the Instron machine and we're gonna see it start to load until eventually the sample breaks off. And that one broke off at darn near 42 megapascals, so a pretty tenacious bond. So we'll talk about some of the values we got through the various cements and techniques. Here are the outcomes or the highlights. As we expected, the bonded resin cements yielded the highest shear bond strength values, values in the mid to high 30s. And these values were very dependent on critical factors. So just because I say, hey, use a bonding agent and use a bonded resin cement, doesn't mean we're gonna get this in practice. These are very, very technique sensitive. First of all, the bonding agent matters. Second of all, spot on application of the protocols. How long you scrub the dentin with the conditioning primer, how you air dry it, how you place the adhesive, how long you air dry that, how thin do you get that film? How well the zirconia puck is air braided? Is it just somebody that's in an assembly line air braiding one crown after another after another with no controls? Or do they get the entire surface equally air braided? Is there a metallic primer application? That really matters. Similar to what silane is to silica-based ceramics, that metallic primer is very important for getting the best bond to zirconia. The remaining three categories yielded lower values. So we're talking about the RMGIs, the borrow ceramics, and the self-adhesive resin cements. The ranges were anywhere from the mid to high single digits up to the mid-teens in shear bond strength values. So a significant drop. Of these, the RMGI tested yielded the highest value of the three. That was the one that was in the teens. More highlights. All the cements that had a resin component to it showed a deterioration in shear bond strength when it was retested after saliva contamination, which is what happens every day in practice for us. We never get a zirconia crown back from the lab, try it in the mouth, check the contacts, floss it, take it out and not have saliva contamination. Nor do we ever get it back from the lab, theoretically well treated and loaded with cement and go directly into the mouth because we don't know if it fits yet. So by definition, it's nearly impossible to have a zirconia crown not have some form of saliva contamination. So anytime we have saliva contamination, the shear bond strength values dropped. The bonded resin cements, the same ones that had the highest values when we treated it correctly, had the most dramatic drop relative in shear bond strength after saliva contamination. 
And at times they drop down to zero, depending on some other parameters. The self-adhesive resin cements and the RMGI cements also have reduced values after saliva contamination. But while they started at a much lower par baseline, the drop was less exaggerated. A lot of them didn't go down to zero. So the take home lesson is there, hey, when you don't need great bond strength because you have good natural retention, your walls are opposing each other, you have decent height, maybe these simplified cements are great because there's not all the steps related to bonding. And at the same time, when you have saliva contamination, while that adhesive values deteriorate, they don't deteriorate as much. So if it's beyond the clinical significance, meaning the forces brought to bear by that patient during normal chewing, mastication, parafunction, aren't enough to overcome that drop, we may be able to just have a very simplified life for certain crowns and just be able to use one of these squirt and go cements. Only one of the cements, the bioceramic cement, this one happened to be Ceramir, had no statistically significant drop in shear bond strength after saliva contamination. Now keep in mind, it started fairly low, but there was no negative impact from saliva, meaning that it maintained its shear bond strength value at par pre and post contamination, meaning there was no additional treatment needed for the cement, but it presents with some benefits that are well touted by the company. And so that's why that's one of my go-to cements in practice for certain cases. More highlights. Once we realize the deterioration in bond strength from saliva contamination, and we started to test the decontamination strategies, all of them showed some decent efficacy in regaining the adhesion when we were going with the bonded resin cement. Remember the bonded resin cements are the ones that deteriorated the most. We're using them because we need them because here's a case where we're not getting natural retention. We can't use the traditional kind of eluding cement. And so those are really the ones we often have to think about decontaminating. And what I'm saying is those different strategies all worked, but in this order of performance. When we treated the contaminated zirconia with IvaClean, it came out number one. We got the highest values post IvaClean decontamination. But remember, all of them have pretty good efficacy. So the downside there is here's a pretty harsh chemical you have to handle it carefully. It's not something you'd ever put near the patient in their mouth. You go to a separate hood or a sink somewhere, you make sure you have your goggles and your gloves on, carefully put it on there, make sure it's not splashing anywhere and you rinse it away. There's the added inventory and the cost, but it works the best. Repeat air abrasion worked pretty darn good too. We got numbers by doing repeat air abrasion that approach the IvaClean numbers. And I'll be honest with you, when we go for one, two, and three, we're going from high 30s to high 20s. So all of these are getting back to above kind of those 20 and above thresholds, but at different levels. So if you have a case where you say there's zero retention or you purposely have done a biomimetic flat top zirconia restoration with no axial walls, you're gonna need the highest bond strength possible. So maybe there's a reason to have some IvaClean on stock. With the repeat air abrasion, the vulnerabilities are first you need equipment. So if you don't have an air abrasion unit, a little cab and a micro etcher, then you don't have that at your disposal. You might wanna think about getting one. You need the material to refill that. You know, you go through that aluminum oxide pretty, pretty regularly. And then the application validation is always a question. Meaning the saliva contamination is invisible. It's not like the zirconia changes color when it hits saliva. And then when you air abrade it enough across the entire surface, it regains a certain color. So you, there's leap of faith knowing that in that cab with those clunky gloves, you've sprayed the entire surface equally and you've made the whole surface fresh again. So there's a little bit of guesswork involved. And then one thing that was kind of a nice surprise that worked was, hey, how about if we get our metallic primers, our MDP primers, paint the zirconia crown or puck in advance of saliva contamination so meaning you've taken the case out of the bag from the lab. First thing you've done is inspected the crown and painted your zirconia primer onto there, let it dry. Now you try it in the patient's mouth. Does that create any kind of a force field? Does that limit the bad effects of the saliva contamination? 
And sure enough, if we did that and did nothing else afterwards to decontaminate, we got the third highest numbers, but still pretty good numbers. It was approaching, you know, within 15, 20% of the initial par values. So we still got a pretty good bond, which means, hey, this is a, maybe the simplest way. This is something we have to have anyway. We need metallic primers. If we're going to bond to zirconia. There's no additional kind of gyrations we had to go through, no added inventory. But remember, it was still a little weaker than the other two. And we have no recourse if we forget to do this. If we're on autopilot, I take it out, try it in the mouth, and it's contaminated. And we say, oh, shoot, I forgot to put the zirconia primer on there. We have to go to option one or two to get our bond values up again. So the reality is, I would say, you probably want to have a couple of these systems in the office and understand exactly what you need to do to bond zirconia. And like I said, the ranges from the above were from the mid-20s all the way up back up to, with honestly, with IvaClean, we can get pretty close to par values of non-contaminated. So what are some of the main takeaways? High strength ceramics provide the opportunity to take advantage of traditional looting, kind of weaker adhesion, and that equals simplified delivery. We have ceramics that don't need adhesive bonded resin cements to reinforce them. So our life becomes much easier. When we have the option, when we have the option, we should take advantage of that. In those cases, we can't ignore the principles of retention and resistance. We have to have good preps in mind. And that's counterintuitive to what ceramics tell us. Through ceramics and the digital workflow, those pathways typically beckon more taper, more rounded, more fluid present preparations, not our excellent, very parallel kind of metallic based prep designs, you know, our, our GV black types of prep designs. And so we can't throw those principles out the window. We do have to have softer preparations that still have some reasonable opposing walls. So that's important to think about. The next thing is of the squirt and go cements between the self-adhesive resin cements or some of the bioactives, to me, the self-adhesive resin cements kind of become the jack of all trades, the master of none. They perform on par or a little bit lower than the RMGI cements with no added benefit. They're only pure resin. Resin shrinks. Resin is somewhat acidic. At least the bioactive categories, while they may have a resin component to them, have the ability to have some benefit to the tooth. So for me, I'm often using the bonded resin cements when I really need something to stick or to reinforce, or I'm using some of the bioactive components. I'm migrating further and further away from using self-adhesive resin cements. Doesn't mean I don't have a few tubes in the office. And sometimes, quite honestly, you're cementing a cementable implant crown to a titanium substrate. There's not gonna be any decay. They're incredibly parallel. You just want something easy to grab and go. I'm not gonna say throw all your self-adhesive resin cements in the garbage. They have a place in dentistry, but they kind of aren't the best option for any one given circumstance. There's usually a better option out there. But when we don't have preps and high string ceramics that allow us to use the simplified cementation protocols, we gotta be very proficient at comprehensive total bonding so that we can practice across the entire gamut of contemporary indirect restoratives, weaker restoratives, minimum preps, poor retention. Whether we find something that's poor retention or we purposefully have a non-retentive design because we're trying to preserve tooth structure when the materials need reinforcement or when the oral environment is so hostile that you know that patient's gonna be much harder on your restorations than a more average patient. And so you need a more intense grab onto the tooth. So as we draw to a close, we'll go over, and this is by no means meant to be a commercial. You'll see I'll have a few different materials out there, but I think to be able to practice contemporary dentistry these days in the cementation world, these are the things we need. I think critically inexpensive, you have to have a micro etcher, and this is sold from Daniel Engineering, which is a component of Zest now. A little cab that you hook up in the back that has a light and a vacuum, micro etcher, and some aluminum oxide. They have different grits available. This is very inexpensive, a few hundred dollars. Besides treating your restorations, these are very useful. They're great for intraoral repairs. Um, they're great for cleaning out cement out of crowns that have become delaminated. They're just useful. They're, it's needed to practice efficiently. It's needed. I think you need a good bioactive cement for those mundane cementations where retention is not an issue, but you think that quote unquote tooth vitamins will deliver some advantage in an acidic environment. 
So some of my favorites, like I said, the bioceramic cement, the Ceramir is one of my favorites. They have a traditional and an implant version. Uh, this was tested to have very low cytotoxicity and very little soft tissue response. You never wanna have cement laying against the outside of the tissue on an implant. We know about peri-implantitis and cement extrusion. We always try to get rid of all the cement. There's techniques for that, but if a little bit stays, this is a cement that seems to have less of a reaction to soft tissue and natural um, kind of periodontium. Another popular RMGI cement that's probably a market leader is GC's Fujisem, and that's you know, their latest version is the Fujisem Evolve. One of the ones we tested was ultra dense RMGI Ultrasem, which had fantastic numbers as far as values. When we're traditionally cementing, we obviously want, or when we're bonding, we want to clean the teeth. So some of the things they have are potentially ways to take off a temporary crown and really clean the substrate. Concepsive scrub is great. It's a slurry that has chlorhexidine built in it, helps with sensitivity control, gets all the old cement and the biological organic gunk out of there. And somebody who's a fan of desensitizers, this is one of my favorite. Hemocide and seal, again, has chlorhexidine, not glued or aldehyde. And it's a great way to treat the teeth, even underneath the provisional restoration. Your patients will have less issues with staining and sensitivity. And of course, if you're using Profi cups and Profi paste to clean the tooth, make sure you're not using one with oils or fluoride. So the Ultra Pro Pure paste that UltraDent sells, unlike their traditional hygiene Profi paste, is the one that's free of all that stuff, the pure version. So you can open that up with a Profi cup and really scrub and pumice the tooth and clean it off. So that's a great way to debride the tooth before cementation or bonding. And of course, you're gonna need the spectrum of the bonded resin cement products and all the ancillary materials. So my favorite and most effective bonding agent that I personally now have tested, I've tested a lot with UltraDent with these, is the Peak Universal Adhesive System. This is their bonding agent, comes in a syringe, and we have two ways of conditioning the tooth structure. If I have largely enamel involved, I'm using phosphoric acid and ultra etch, I think is the best etch out there because of the way you can place it precisely and have it not run off. So I can just, when I'm doing selective etching, just place this on the enamel margins. And of course the peak self etching primer is how I treat the dentin when there's a mass of dentin involved. So often I'm doing selective etching where I'm using both, but if it's primarily dentin, like with most crowns, I'm using a two-step process when it's primary enamel, still two steps, but with total etching, and then we go to the bonding agent. We found that two-step, so quote unquote, six generation approach leads to the highest dentin bond strength values. There's a big push to go to universal adhesives. They're great, they work well, but I can't lie to you. We always get a couple of standard deviations, higher bond values when we use a two-step protocol compared to a one bottle, one drop universal product. So there are good universal products out there, but we're talking about deviations from the 30 megapascals of bond strength, suddenly jumping up to the 50 megapascals and plus of bond strength. And that matters both for your direct dentistry and indirect dentistry. Incidentally, I mentioned that Peak comes in a syringe. The curved bristle tips that connect to that syringe give an awesome mechanical advantage for scrubbing the adhesive into the tooth structure. That said, Peak also comes in a traditional bottle format for anybody that prefers to use drops out of a bottle and a standalone micro brush. So you essentially get your choice. We obviously need a good dual cure and light cured bonded resin cement. Dual cure for the areas, posterior, thicker restorations where we can't get light and a light cured bonded resin for veneers and things in the front where it's not very thick, you wanna have the luxury of clearing the cement away before you hit it with the light and have it go through its curing process. Two of my favorite um, materials out there are either the Permashade kit, uh, which is a very comprehensive kit. Of course, you can buy all these things separately. You can see it's pictured with phosphoric acid, uh, silica or hydrofluoric acid for silica-based, silane, all the tips, the different shades. But here's one of the syringes up close. This one happens to be an opaque white. Usually you need three or four main uh, cement shades to pull off thin ceramics so that you can get the final presentation or reveal that you need. 
most common one most folks are using is translucent, but at times you need something more opaque. Sometimes you need something more of in the bleach shade range. Sometimes you need something warmer to give it some denton color in the A2 range. And the other company that I think makes a great product is Kerr's product, the NX3, which here's the dual barrel for the dual cure approach and the base only for when doing light cure only in veneers. Finally, uh, some of the other ancillary products. Remember for zirconia, we need a metallic primer. So one of the materials tested in the sabbatical I did in the study was using PEAKS ZM, stands for zirconia slash metal primer. So anytime you're bonding to zirconia or a metallic crown, if you're still doing gold or uh, PFM base and you wanna get a higher bond value, this is what you would line it with. Um, Monobond Plus is a competitor product from Ivoclar. And what they will have is all the adhesive priming kind of ingredients in there. So you could use this on an area that you would silenate as well as on an area where you would use a metallic primer. And of course, we talked about Ivoclean, which is the very alkaline material that we would put on the inside of a zirconia crown that's been tried in to decontaminate it. So closing thoughts as we wrap up. Um, I think when a product or technology can afford you the chance to improve your quality, but also improve your speed and predict predictability, I think it's a rare opportunity. We have to capitalize on it. It's more important now than ever before as our timetables are tighter, our, our practice efficiencies and overheads are higher. Um, and I just hate, I hate for crowns to come off. I hate for patients to have sensitivity. And it's really important to really understand these concepts to pull off cases effortlessly without a lot of recall and issues coming up. So with that, I will thank everybody attending. A big thanks for Ultradent for hosting this platform. And again, there is my email. If anybody needs to get further clarification, ask for questions. Otherwise, hope to see everybody out there at a live event soon as we start to get back to some normalcy. Be safe and happy cementation. Bye now.